Guys, this, this idea that Gentiles are grafted into Israel and therefore grafted into the keeping of the Sabbath and the kosher food laws and the feasts and so on, this idea keeps popping up and it's just not true. In fact, it's demonstrably false. So I just have to take a minute to address it. Now, are we Gentiles grafted into the people of God that came before us? Absolutely. That's what Romans 11 teaches. But we're not grafted into national Israel, thus becoming Jewish. We don't become Abraham's children in the flesh, but rather Abraham's seed through faith in Yeshua. Gentiles are grafted into what the Apostle Paul calls the Israel of God, meaning the people or family of God. Let's unpack that. In 1 Corinthians 7, Christians are told to live as we are called. So what does that mean? Well, this passage teaches that if you were Jewish when you were called to faith in Jesus, stay Jewish. And if you were Gentile, stay, stay Gentile. In other words, Jewish believers in Jesus are not required to leave behind one ounce of their Jewishness. And Gentile believers aren't required to adopt one ounce of Jewish tradition. Scripture maintains a distinction between believing Jews and non-Jews, even into the end times. Now, yes, whether we're Jew or Gentile makes no difference in terms of salvation. We're all the same in Christ who tore down the dividing wall of hostility between Jews and Gentiles, and we've become one new man in Christ. However, while the dividing wall has been torn down, the distinction wasn't removed. For whatever reason, God, in His sovereignty, throughout His written word, maintains a distinction between Jews and Gentiles, between Israel and the other nations. The gospel is first to the Jew and also to the Gentile. And judgment will come first to the Jew and also to the Gentile. And those who do good will receive glory and honor and peace, first to the Jew and also to the Gentile. And this distinction is explicitly taught in Revelation 7, where we see every tribe of Israel listed by name, each contributing 12,000 people to the, to the 144,000 people that will be sealed. And then just a few verses later, we read about a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. The distinction between the nations doesn't go away in the kingdom of God. He is the God of all the nations. And his kingdom isn't about uniformity, but about unity among diversity. So as opposed to what replacement theology teaches, Israel isn't replaced by the church, and, and it doesn't disappear as an entity in Scripture like a, like a Jewish bucket of water tossed into a Gentile sea. And on the other hand, contrary to what Torahism teaches, Gentiles aren't called to become Torah-observant Jews and, and lose their Gentile identity like, like a Gentile river being absorbed into a Jewish ocean. No. Yahweh is the God of both Jews and Gentiles, and the gospel is for both Jews and Gentiles. And as Jews and Gentiles, his people comprise the church, the bride of Christ, right? You can't have a marriage without both a husband and a wife, right? Well, the same is true of the body of Christ. Without both Jews and Gentiles, it's not the body of Christ. None of us get to choose whether we're born Jewish or Gentile. That's a decision that God makes for us. And we honor God by living out our identities as God gave them to us without shame, celebrating both the diversity and the unity in the body of Christ. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slave or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. But as it is, God arranged the members of the body, each one of them, as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. This is why when Gentile believers in Jesus work so hard to adopt Jewish practices, hosting Passover seders and, and wearing tzitzit, many Jews will consider this a matter of cultural misappropriation. And there's a sense in which it can also be seen as an affront to God. 
I mean, it's strikingly similar to the idea at the center of the transgender community where a person honestly feels like they're a man trapped in a woman's body or, or vice versa. So they dress and act like the opposite sex and in some cases take even more drastic measures in an effort to become more like the gender they identify with rather than the one they were born with. Now, whatever your opinion, we can all agree that the people who feel this way didn't choose the gender they were born with. God determines our gender. And while most Torah-keeping Gentiles would never put it this way, they often operate as if they feel like Jews trapped in a Gentile body. They, they adopt distinctly Jewish rituals and traditions and, and sometimes even dress like Jews in an attempt to become more like the ethnicity they identify with rather than the one God determined for them. For God's family in Yeshua, the Mosaic customs are permitted but not required. Now for Jewish believers in Jesus, an argument could be made that they're not only allowed but maybe even at some level expected to continue keeping certain Torah customs as a, as a boundary marker of their Jewish identity. Things like Shabbat and the Kashrut food laws and circumcision and the feasts, these are distinctly Jewish customs that go all the way back to the foundation of the nation of Israel at Mount Sinai. And Jesus and the New Testament writers seem to tacitly assume that Jewish believers will continue to do so. This is why, for example, Jesus can say, pray that your flight may not be on a Sabbath, right? Because he has every expectation that his Jewish followers will still be keeping Sabbath. Those things are nowhere prohibited or forbidden or taught as coming to an end. And at the same time, the New Testament nowhere teaches that Gentile followers should or are expected to keep any Torah customs. They weren't given to or expected of Gentiles in the Old Testament, and they aren't taught or even hinted at in the New. In fact, the Jerusalem Council unambiguously declared that Gentiles are not required to keep the law of Moses or be circumcised. So that's not even in question. Now, can Gentile believers keep these customs if they want? Sure. Again, they're nowhere prohibited or forbidden. These things are permitted but not required of Christians. So if you're a Gentile and you feel called by the Holy Spirit to, to keep the weekly Shabbat, for example, go for it. But anyone teaching that Christians, and in particular Gentile Christians, are somehow required or expected to keep Torah customs is teaching a lie. Sorry to be so blunt, but there it is. The New Testament, particularly in the book of Hebrews, makes it abundantly clear that under Jesus and the New Covenant, the law of Moses does not remain whole or, or wholly in effect. It's not done away with, it's not abolished, but because of the work of Jesus, its application and its obligations have shifted. The Old Covenant has come to an end and the New Covenant has begun. And Christians who choose not to eat kosher or keep the Sabbath or be circumcised or, or keep the feasts, aren't living in sin or, or lawlessness or disobedience. And to teach that they are is unbiblical and it's wrong and I would even say dangerous. Thanks for watching. Shalom.